Hi, everybody. This is Mission Control Houston. We want to welcome you guys there at the Heritage Middle School in uh, Idaho. I'm joined by Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger, who is an astronaut. I'm Josh Byerly here, and uh, Dottie is willing to take your questions. She'll probably take all the hard ones. I'll take the easy ones. So, <laughs> yeah, <it is>, Josh. <laughs> so I think we're ready to go. What's our first question? Okay, are you guys there? We're ready to take your questions here inside Mission Control. So if you're ready to go ahead, go ahead and step up and ask uh, whatever you want to ask us. All right, so let's start with Tyler. Do you have a question for them? Good morning. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Uh, are there any uh, stressful situations that you see in the movies that are like life or death situations? Are there any stressful or life or death situations? Well, we do have emergencies arrive, arise while we are doing space flight. Um, but as you can see, probably um, earlier you were looking at mission control and that's where we're sitting. We've got a whole team of people here on Earth as well as the whole crew that can work through emergencies together. So if there were a fire or a depressurization or any of the ammonia leak, we have procedures that we would run and we practice these here on Earth. Just like you guys probably practice fire drills, maybe even some earthquake drills there in the Northwest. Um, so. We practice those things. Um, Any time a medical situation could arise, and we have crew members who are trained as the medical officers, unless they're already a doctor and then they're completely certified. So um, we do have ways of dealing with emergencies that can arise, arise on station. The next question. Um, what would you say would be NASA's greatest accomplishment? What would I say that is NASA's greatest accomplishment? Well, I think putting humans in space is quite an amazing uh, accomplishment. So I'm I'm very glad that we pursued that um, back in the 50s and 60s when we finally were launching folks into space. But I'd also say we've done a lot of amazing things in exploration um, that is also non human space flight. So, um, but putting a human in space is, is quite a feat because of all the things we as humans need, um, besides, you know, just food and water. I mean, thinking about how uh, we have to provide air that's clean um, and fresh and then scrub the carbon dioxide from it and how we need to take care of uh, our, our bodily needs besides just eating that we need to have bathrooms and things like that. So all those things needed to be designed and taken care of uh, for space flight and I'm, I'm really impressed how we have we, ha we first did that and we have continued to evolve it through time and how it's it's really working great on the space station now. All right next question. All right person. <laughs> um, yes, when you were on the International Space Station, what did you do with the free time you may have had? That's a yes. great question. Um, there's not a lot of free time in space, but when you have it, there are two favorite things that I did. And one was look out the window. And I actually looked down on Idaho when I was up there because uh, I taught not far away from Idaho. I taught in Vancouver, Washington. And so I'm very familiar with the Pacific Northwest. I love the volcanoes and have climbed a couple of them. And so I would look out the window down at the United States and then places I've never been in the world, um, never been south of the equator. And so it was amazing amazing to look at South America, Australia, Africa, all these places that I really want to travel to someday. Um, and there's just also looking at space, uh, the moon, stars, planets. Um, I enjoyed looking at the moon because it was in a crescent phase while I was there. So it just, it looks really neat against the dark sky. It's really beautiful. Um, my other favorite pastime, of course, is floating and doing <laughs> cool tricks, <laughs> flipping around in space. You know, Dottie talked about them not having a whole lot of free time. A lot of things that some people don't really understand is back whenever they used to fly the shuttle and station missions together, these crews were actually scheduled in five-minute increments. So they would be handed a schedule every day that had five-minute chops of time that they had to basically stick with throughout the entire day. So that they, they kind of gives you a sense of exactly what they were doing all, it was all day busy, long. definitely. All right. Um, uh, Daddy? Yes. Um, how often does the surgeon have to help the astronauts in extreme situations? 
how often do we have to help with extreme situations? Not very often. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a couple of things in the last few years come up. Of Sometimes we have to do debris avoidance maneuvers because there's space junk, and so we um, are tracking this junk here on Earth, and then we have to... Um, maybe move the space station, or sometimes we just are aware of the junk and we don't have to move, but crews might have yeah. to shelter for a while. Um, other, We did have a pump module go down um, almost two August yeah. ago. Yeah, almost two years ago in August. And that um, was uh, it was very important because it helps cool our space station. It keeps all of the equipment cooled, and it moves all this fluids around, so it keeps things cooled. So... Um, that was an emergency, but it wasn't such an emergency that we had to like go out the door immediately and do the spacewalk. We had time to plan it here on Earth, make really good decisions, and then go do the spacewalks and uh, repair it. And yeah. we worked as a team and repaired it. And now the space station's back functioning 100%. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just amazing what we can do. Um, but yeah, sometimes emergencies come up. But like I said, we have a good way of handling them. They train a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we, the crew, train, but also the ground team trains. They I do. Mean, they do simulations all the time here. So. I mean, we, we, the, the flight controllers here, there's there's probably 20 people in this room. They all have different jobs, but they practice pretty much worst-case scenarios a lot of times with, you know, what, what's kind of the, the worst bad day you can have and, and how they react to that. So, right. So whenever it comes time for the actual flight, it's, it's a little bit easier. It's actually slower. Easier. It's actually slower. Yeah. Um, when, when you found out that you were going to be up in the space station, what kind of preparations did you have? To, what did they be, like mental or physical? Oh, great question. Well, um, training for us for the flight that I went on, which was a shuttle flight going to space station, um, you find out about a year, a year and a half out, and so that's the mental preparation. Is you start actually training as a team, and there were seven of us on this team, and and we were um, going to classes. And you you start out, you you have your assignments. So I was like the flight engineer, and I was the inside um, coordinator of the spacewalks, and so you have your job, and then you start learning it, and then uh, and then you start doing these simulations like I talked about, then they start throwing in failures, and pretty soon you're, you're really working as a smooth team. So um, that was, again, about a year and a half out. And uh, and then physically, I mean, we are always training. Um, we work out here on Earth a couple times a week as astronauts. We have a gym, um, we weight lift, we do a lot of things to just prepare that way. And uh, we also, for the people that are going to go do a spacewalk, they're in the neutral buoyancy lab for about six hours at a time, and they do that multiple times for each spacewalk. So we might practice a spacewalk four to seven times before we go do that. Um, and now, with the International Space Station, crews are preparing and starting training two and a half years before they fly. Yeah. So um, that's quite a commitment. And of course, it's not just the astronaut, it's the whole family that is um, mm -hmm. it's kind of in training. And so there's travel and all these things that are involved. But uh, you're just really open with your family, and you discuss what you'll do um, when things come up and how to, to deal with that. So that's how we prepare mentally and physically for space flight. Um, Blake, you how, how does NASA hook up spacecraft to the space station for boarding? How do you hook up spacecraft to the space station for boarding? Oh, okay, that, that's yes. I didn't quite hear it. Thanks. Um, great question. Uh, we have different docking compartments, and we also have different vehicles that come to the space station. So for humans coming to the space station, they're coming on a Soyuz right now, and there are specific docking compartments for the Soyuz that are at the back of the station in the Russian module. And, uh, and then you have hatches that you go through, and there's all these pressurizations before you open hatches. and, and this, So that's how we get humans into space right now. Um, when we had the shuttle, we also had another docking compartment, and it worked a little bit differently for such a big vehicle, and it was out in the front of the space station. Uh, currently, we have the ATV, the European cargo vehicle that stocked a space station, and that came up robotically, and so um, it just stocks uh, without the need of humans, although humans know how they could intervene right. if they need to. And then we're going to be having this summer a visiting vehicle called um, HTV-3, and that's from the Japanese uh, 
um, space agency, and that will dock to the front of station, and that uses the robotic arm. And so a crew member actually is um, needed the last few meters to take the robotic arm and grapple the HTV-3 and then berth it to the space station. So lots of different ways that people and cargo come to space station. And if you ever watch it on TV and you see, you know, back when we had shuttle and it would dock with the station or any of the Russian stuff, it looks so slow on yeah. TV. And you forget that they're going more than 17,000 miles an hour, both of those spacecraft, and they each weigh exactly. hundreds of thousands of pounds. So it's, it's a little bit misleading when you see it on TV. It looks so slow and cautious, and it's really going pretty fast. So, right. So it's impressive. Right. All relative. Yeah. yeah. Relative motion. Who's next? Are you ready? Did you ask yet? How about Lexi? Other Brittany? <laughs> um, okay, exactly. Um, what is the most stressful part about a space shuttle flight? Wow, the most stressful part? Well, you know, the great thing about all the training was that you feel very prepared. But I will say that I was definitely um, excited, maybe had a little bit of butterflies when I went out to the pad on that day to launch because you've got so much propellant and you've got two solid rocket boosters that you know um, and you know how you get to space, all this thrust and energy. Mm -hmm. So you want that energy to be going the right direction. So, um, And that you don't have control of. That has been designed by really talented engineers. And that's, you just have trust and uh, you know that we have done this many times and you've seen it. And so um, I was really excited, but I, I think that was the first time I felt a bit nervous before getting um, into the spaceship. And then um, not, a, not a lot of stress in space because even when things went wrong, like we had things go wrong on our spacewalks, but we had trained for what to do and we yeah. had talked about contingency situations and we had plans. And again, like I said, we talked to the ground a lot and they have really good ideas too. So as we do all this teamwork, um, I just felt like we were all very prepared and very calm and we had good rationale for why we were doing what we were doing. So during flight, no stressful situations. It was awesome. It's, uh, Dottie mentioned something very interesting that even when it's stressful, it's, it's pretty calm. And it's, it's the same way as somebody who's, who's been inside mission control and kind of watched uh, certain challenges come up during flight. It's not like the movies where you see you know, a lot of chaos yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, it, the team is very uh, focused. Um, they've trained for these kind of things. And even whenever you know, certain semi-major things have happened, um, it, it's just very calm and professional. It's, it's not like what you, what you would expect. So. Right. Who's next? How about Ben? Um, how much money is spent at NASA each year? Oh, money spent. Uh, well, we get a budget from the government, and we just get a portion of that for um, human spaceflight and for the ISS operations. So you can actually go look up the exact details. Maybe you want to fill in yeah, a here, little okay. bit. But <laughs> <laughs> so out of the entire federal budget, you know, a lot of people have, uh, they think that NASA gets a, a huge chunk of right. money, and we do, relatively speaking, we get about $17, 18000000000 billion a year. But out of the entire federal budget, that is less than one half of one yeah. percent of all the money. So, so our share, NASA's share of the entire federal budget is actually n not that big at all. The biggest that it ever was was back during Apollo, and that was only about four percent of the entire federal budget. So it's it's, you know, it's it's a relatively small uh, chunk of money in terms of the entire federal government spending. But but you get a lot of benefits out of it in terms of spinoffs and. And, and what this agency is able to do. Yeah, and I think, of course, one of the big benefits is that um, we learn about how we can go explore better, right. and, and we want to continue human spaceflight. So we want you guys to be explorers, too, just like the people that came to the Northwest when, uh, when they were exploring for the early United States. So we want you guys to be explorers, yeah. too. Uh, was there anything you didn't like about space travel that was maybe uncomfortable? Something uncomfortable about space travel. Well, um, the suit hot. is really <laughs> hot, yes, and that's not kidding. And it's heavy, a bit heavy. Um, so uh, for all crew members, even those that are launching on Soyuz, you're going to have a specific suit that you launch in, and you have to sit for a while. You go out to the vehicle, and you get loaded in, and then you sit, and you wait. And uh, in the Soyuz, you wait You wait with your knees scrunched up against you, yeah. and in the shuttle, you're laying down on your back, too. And, and uh, so... 
Um, to keep us cooled off in the shuttle, we had this long underwear with little hoses in it that ran cold water through it, and you could keep pretty cool, and there was blowing air, circulating air, so that helped you. Um, and thankfully, the April morning that we launched on two years ago was uh, pretty cool for Florida, but it could get really hot. There's even mosquitoes sometimes yeah. that get in the vehicle. So that part <laughs> could all be a little uncomfortable until, you know, you finally launch. And then um, returning, same thing, you have to get back into that suit, and you know, you've been in a normal clothes. I mean, I wore this shirt in space, and you've been in these normal clothes, and then you have to get back into the suit, and it's not really comfortable. Um, but you would totally do it for a few moments yeah. of space flight. Well, they have to drink a lot, too. Talk about fluid loading. You just have to, they have to drink yeah. a lot of, like, sport drinks and things like that. They used to have to drink kind of some, like, basically chicken soup water. Right, down, there's you know? chicken consomme, and then also we did um, water and salt tablets. That's what yeah. I personally chose to do. And you do that just before you're deciding to make uh, the burn to deorbit. And so this is maybe an hour, two hours before you're going to be landing. You're drinking lots of bags of water. I mean, I think I was trying to drink six, eight ounce bags of water. That's a lot. And, um, and you're still trying to push buttons and, you know, follow the normal checklist while drinking this stuff. Um, needless to say, it is not super comfortable <laughs> <laughs> to drink all that while, and then re-enter gravity. Because yeah. before, uh, all those fluids are kind of floating in your stomach, no big deal. But then when you start to re-enter, you start to feel it on your bladder and that's not super comfortable yeah. either. So, yeah. <laughs> Who's next? Okay, Hannah. Um, how do you shower? Aha, uh -huh. you may not <laughs> like this answer. <laughs> you don't really take a shower, per se. Um, it's it's kind of like camping, a little bit uh, cleaner since you're not hanging out with the dirt. But um, you use uh, baby wipes to just kind of wash your skin off. Um, there's also some uh, wet towels and, and soap rinse that you can get on your skin and, and clean yourself with. Um, and then there's a no rinse shampoo that you work through your hair and it becomes quite messy. Because um, if you think about it, uh, when you wash your hair, you know you have extra hair that falls out or you have skin that sloughs off. And where does that stuff go in space? It goes floating around you. So you have to make sure you keep your hair, like we stick it to um, gray tape and we just kind of accumulate that way and then put it in the trash so that it's not floating around and, and getting in everyone's way, especially my hair, that'd be kind of messy. So um, that's how we keep ourselves clean. And But you can do it daily um, or you can do it after your exercise. So you do need to keep yourself clean. It's definitely part of the important hygiene part in space. I mean, um, you don't want to be up there six months and not be keeping yourself clean. So, so who wants to be an astronaut now? <laughs> <laughs> who wants to be around the other astronauts, right? <laughs> Who's next? Okay, the other hand. What kind of education is required to become an astronaut? Like, what kind of education Say that one more time. What kind of education is required to go up in space? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. You have good ears. Um, you need to have a at least a bachelor's in math, engineering, or science. And then, of course, uh, further degrees are definitely encouraged and an experience in those degrees. So doing research or um, teaching, et cetera, in those degrees. And uh, so that's why we really hope that you are studying math, science, technology, and engineering, those good core STEM um, classes. And also, you know, this is one thing we always try to tell students and, and even college kids, too, that if, if you want to come work at NASA, and you, you, maybe you're not going to be an astronaut, but if you want to come work here, we hire all kinds of backgrounds. I mean, I've got a degree in communications, yeah. and there's other people in our office that have journalism degrees and marketing degrees, and we've got people that have human resources degrees. We've got budget people. I mean, there's all kinds. So That's if you right. want to come work at NASA and be part of this, it's one of the coolest jobs on the planet. And, you know, you can get there through all, through all sorts of that's paths. Right. So, you should so be passionate about what you're pursuing. That's the key. Right. Is go for something that you really want to do, and it's funny what doors tend to, uh, tend to open up. Absolutely. So. You guys got another one? Um, Austin? Um, when you go up into space, is the pressure really bad on your ears? Actually, no. It's uh, the way that we design the uh, the shuttle and our our vehicles is so that you really have very little change in pressure. Um, you do get a little a slight change, but it is minimal compared to what you would experience in an airplane or what you would experience driving up into the mountains. Yeah. So. Um, the, not a change because the the idea is that as you um, ch as you go up and and decrease the air pressure on the outside of the vehicle, you have um, a, the vehicle has to 
maintain the pressure inside very well. I mean, you don't want any leaks out, and uh, you, you don't, wouldn't want it to burst because it would be higher pressure inside and it would burst mm -hmm. out. So we've designed our aircraft so that it maintains about 14.7 psi, which is roughly equal to what sea pressure is. So you have a little bit less air pressure in Idaho because you're up higher in altitude, but um, that is that's what we maintain within our spacecraft. And the same with the space station. It's roughly 14.7. Yeah. Who's next? In, in um, mission control, how many different jobs are there? Oh, that is a great question. Um, like Josh was saying. We're counting. Hang on. There's yeah, <laughs> more looking around. There's, probably, there's about 20 people in yeah. here right now. That we have all sorts of jobs from the flight controller and flight director, mm -hmm. um, who's in charge of everyone and, and is overseen, to um, the person who talks with the crew members, that's the cap, CAPCOM, capsule communicator. Um, and then we have people who are looking at trajectory, people that um, are maintaining the life support systems, the thermal systems, uh, the computers, the daily calendar, um, the public outreach, all these different jobs yeah. in mission control. All working as a team. There's flight doctors. There's and there's a there's an interesting position called ground controller GC, which is uh, here in the back of the room, and then the shuttle room is up at the front. But those guys run the entire mission control center, and they've got more computer screens over there than I've ever seen in my life. I mean, th these guys know how to run every exactly piece of system in this entire building, every mile of wire that we have here. So they they've got a pretty pretty tough job, and they're also the ones that actually help us communicate uh, with the space station and and the shuttle back in the day. So it's. Uh, there's, it takes a, it takes a, a big and wide, of, uh, a pretty big variety of people to uh, to help make all this work. Okay, if you have questions, then mom's asking. I can't remember who I call mom. Do I have it? Anybody over here have a question? Okay, let's go to Caitlin. In your time in space, what seems to be the longest job you did throughout the time? Uh, while I was up in space, I was just there for about 15 days, and the job that I did the most was um, to actually be a mover. We brought up six tons of equipment, and we needed to move that all out of um, basically this big U-Haul vehicle called the Multipurpose Logistics Module, and uh, get that out and get it onto station, and then we had to return trash and equipment, and so we repacked. So most of my time was as a mover. Um, the other significant portion of my time was as a uh, as the choreographer inside of the spacewalk. So I talked to the um, to Rick Mastracchio and Clay Anderson as they were doing their spacewalks the whole time. So it was a lot of talking. That was three days, about six and a half to seven hours of talking, telling them about the bolts they were going to be turning, about um, where their next uh, move was going to be, where the robotic arm was going to pick up an ammonia tank, where it was going to drop it off, etc. So that was my next job. And then my final big job was as the flight engineer, but that was just on launch and entry, so that was just kind of a small job. She got to sit up on the flight deck and actually see awesome. out the window, so awesome. she had a cool job. <laughs> Who's next? Yeah, Ryan, um, when you're in space, how much sleep do you get? When you're in space, how much sleep do you get? Well, we can actually get just as much sleep here on the ground. And I slept really well in space. Um, I didn't usually here on Earth. I try to get about eight hours of sleep because I, I exercise a lot. I just kind of need eight hours to be a happy person. Um, but in space, it didn't seem, I think, because you're not having to put as much resistance since you're not working with uh, working against gravity the whole time, I didn't need uh, quite as much sleep. So I found about seven hours was actually yeah. really great. And the funny thing is when we sleep in space, we sort of look like zombies because mm -hmm. our arms float out in front of That's us. That's kind of creepy. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you sleep so well because you're not forced onto a bed. You're just kind of floating above it. And so you strap yourself into your sleeping bag. Sometimes I s you stick yourself to the wall, don't you? Yep. Into, yeah. You have to Velcro yourself, or um, in our case, we had to f use French hooks and, and put ourselves onto the wall. And uh, if you want firmness, you can put bungees around you and like really suck yourself to the wall. But I kind of like that feeling of yeah. floating. So that's how you sleep in space. Oh, say it again. Uh -huh. Uh, what is going through your mind when you realize you're up in space and you're not on your home uh, Earth anymore? You're stuck there for about two months. Well, I think you definitely realize um, kind of the 
precarious position or the um, the position where if something went wrong, you would want to fix it fast because your vehicle is your life support. It is your only way of staying alive in space. Um, and so you definitely take care of the vehicle. And uh, But it was just such a beautiful experience. I mean, looking at the earth and the floating. And, and so getting used to that floating, getting used to the fact that when you drop something, it uh, doesn't fall to the ground. It floats somewhere and gets caught up in some fan or filter or wherever you have to go find it. So that took some getting used to. But um, just you really look at uh, the beauty of the Earth and just how amazing it is that you can be in space, that, that we designed these vehicles to be in space. Is that it? What's the most exciting thing that you're seeing while in space? Say one more time. What was that? What's the most exciting thing that you've seen while you were in space? The most exciting thing? Well, um, looking back at where my family was right at the moment. So when uh, we could pick out, there was one particular pass I remember early on in the flight, and Jim Dutton is from uh, Oregon. So the two of us were looking through the cupola, and uh, we found Crater Lake, and then we could find all these places that we had either lived in or we had family living in. And so we went from the Oregon-Washington coast all the way across the United States down to Houston. And that was, it was just this neat pass. And, and all along the way, we had people that we knew or cared about. So so my parents are in Colorado, my husband's family's in the Northwest, and my family right now, my husband and daughter, are here in Houston. So that was a really special, special moment. All right, it looks like that's all the time that we have for questions, but I would like to have you guys say uh, goodbye to each other. So let's start with uh, Heritage Middle School. Would you like to thank uh, our special guests for uh, uh, coming to your school live, uh, virtually, through the Digital Learning Network? And thank you guys too. You were really good. You had great questions. I enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, we want to thank you guys for joining us. It's always fun to talk to you guys. So we hope to uh, we hope to see you again here in Mission Control, Houston.